You are listening to the One Day at a Time podcast. On this podcast, my guests share their stories of alcoholism, addiction, and how they recovered so that you can too. My hope is that you find the inspiration and resources you need to let go what's holding you back so that you can transform into the person you were always meant to be. Ready? Here we go. Hello, loves. Thank you for downloading the podcast. My name is Arlena, and I'll be your host. Today, my guest is Mike Collins, and he has been sober for over 35 years. Mike is the founder of SugarAddiction.com, and his book, The Last Resort Sugar Detox, has been read by hundreds of thousands of people. Obviously, lots of people will struggle with sugar. His online 30-day challenge, the Sugar Freedom Challenge, has been successfully completed by thousands of people as well. I'm actually doing the challenge myself for the month of July because I have been eating way too many damn cookies. And let's be real, who doesn't want to lose a few extra pounds? Am I right? And I am inviting all my listeners, whether you're following the One Day at a Time podcast page or in my private women's group, I'm inviting everyone to join me in the sugar-free challenge of July. You can actually register for the July challenge at sugaraddiction.com forward slash Arlena. And if you register through my link, I will send you a special gift. And if you didn't know, my first name is spelled A-R-L-I-N-A. But before we jump in, I'd like to offer the One Day at a Time podcast newsletter. It's a collection of the latest episodes, maybe a book recommendation, a meditation, something fun because we like to have fun and some awesome podcasts I'm listening to. There are so many amazing people out there doing sober podcasts. So I want to share some of those people with you. You can actually sign up for free at odatchat.com, O-D-A-A-T, chat.com. And if you sign up, I hope you enjoy it. Don't forget to follow me on YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook, where I'm sharing practical solutions through video clips and links to more resources to help you get sober, stay sober, and go deeper. All of the links to all of the socials will be in the show notes on the website. So there you have it. Please enjoy this conversation with Mike. Well, Mike, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, so the three things they're going to learn today is how sugar affects the brain, what they should eat instead, and how to quit sugar. I'm going to ask you all those questions pretty soon. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just right out the gate. This is what you're going to get. Uh, the lightning round, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then we'll do your lightning round. But uh, so welcome to the podcast. I'm so glad you're here. Everybody's addicted to sugar. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. I don't know about everybody, but it is close to everybody, I guess. Yeah, you're right. Well, I guess you're not anymore, right? Yeah, uh, this. Uh, but there's not. We're pretty rare. There's, uh, you know, seventy four percent of the food products on the shelves have sugar in them. So people 74%. are four li- percent. Wow. Yeah, people are a little. Uh, they don't quite realize that, even though they think they don't eat sweets or whatever, they're still getting a lot of sugar. Wow, sugar in the food. I think they do it because it's so addictive, right? Absolutely, they they put they slide people into MRIs and and uh, watch their brain light up so while they test their products. True oh, story. Oh right, yeah. yeah. So the brain, the MRIs are the, they attach the probes to your brain and then mm. they examine that they feed you sugar while mm. you're doing the MRI and then they yeah. look it on the screen. Yep, they do it, and they you know since the cigarette companies took over the food companies in the eighties. They've adapted the addictive model, the addiction model. Wow. You know? It's a yeah. conspiracy. <laughs> it's kind of, well, I mean, it works. If it sells yeah. more product, people keep coming back. For so, sure. Yeah. yeah, no, I get that. Um, before we jump into all this stuff about sugar addiction, I wanted to start off with the lightning round. I, I uh, subject all my guests <laughs> yeah, no worries. No <laughs> to worries. the lightning round. Do you have a favorite recovery book? You know, I'm a big fan of a guy a lot of people have never heard of. His name is William White, Bill White. He's actually kind of my mentor, but you can look him up at the William White papers online. Uh, but he's a recovery advocate. He's he studied recovery for, he's like uh, the mentor to a lot of people. And his mentor was a guy named Ernie um, 
Ernie Case? No, Ernie. Anyway, Ernie something, he's a Harvard school guy, and he wrote a book about the history of AA. Um, Not God, I think the name of it is. But that group of folks are, it's a little different than a lot of people have read, but it's really, uh, Bill and I wrote an article together about the future of recovery, but Bill has been working in the trenches for 30 or 40 years uh, for recovery advocacy and really about the new recovery advocacy movement, which is, um, you know, if you say you're in recovery, you're in recovery, no dogma around it, no, you know, worry about harm reduction or, um, you know, that kind of stuff. It's really, it's a little philosophical for folks, but it's just, you know, just amazing stuff. I, I, it's kind of, it's a little anthropological in the history of, the, of recovery movements. Actually, one of the books is about the history of recovery movements, go predating AA by hundreds of years. Um, you know, Carry Nation and uh, the Handsome Society, and and there's an Indian Society. Like, really, a lot of recovery that predates even AA, and 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 he brings it all the way to the literally to the present and then the future. It's just a uh, yeah, William White, Bill White, amazing guy, and his mentor. Uh, what is Ernie's last name? I can't remember. But anyway, just when good you think stuff. of it, let me know, and we'll, we'll put will. all this in the show notes for sure. Yeah, very cool. A lot of people like the history of you know yeah. twelve step, and and so um, be cool to get an outside perspective too. Yeah. Um, do you have a favorite quote or mantra that you live by? Wow. Or maybe that's a good one that's kind of. Right. Up in your world right now? Yeah. Uh, hmm. It takes everything it takes. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> it takes everything and, it takes. And that really applies a lot to the sugar stuff, you know. It's right. Like, it ta- in, 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 in uh, you know, 12 st- or in uh, alcohol and drug, it's it takes every drink it takes or whatever. It takes right, every drug yeah. it takes. And, you know, we say it takes every sugar, uh, takes takes every sweet treat it took, you know, because people feel guilty, right? They feel like, well, I wait, once they find this, they lose weight, they feel better, you know, whatever. And then they feel like I wasted, like you do when you get in any kind of recovery, like I wasted all this time. And if you get bogged down with that, it's just going to bog you down more. So it takes everything it takes. It takes everything. That's a, that's a lovely, um, sentiment of compassion and empathy i love that yeah it's the antidote to shame um do you have a regular self-care or recovery practice like i know you've been in recovery for a long time do you do you go to meetings or do you just practice a morning self-care routine i do i do yoga every morning um and i think the meetings that i have seven days a week uh (laughs) have healed me no really yeah. In the last, since we started these about three or four years ago, have healed me more than the previous 30 plus years of recovery wow. did because I was focused much more on other people mm-hmm. trying to, you know, get that information out and, you know, answer the same questions over and over and over and over again. And I, you know, at the fir- at first I was like, oh God. And then I started to realize it's almost like a practice in and of itself, you right. know? Yeah. And, and it was like a, a, a consistency. Um, and yeah, I mean, now I realize that I need those meetings as much as the folks need our, you know, that meet the people that come to them need them. So, yeah. And, you know, I, it's gotten a little bigger and now I got internet guys and all that kind of other stuff. And I still just do the meetings, you know? Yeah. And so, yeah. Seven days a week, huh? Yeah. yeah. That's commitment. Yeah. Or insanity. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> uh, right. It's both. It's both. <laughs> it's uh, a commitment to treat the insanity. <laughs> right, right. I don't know. Yeah. No, I uh, I do something every day myself. So no ju- no judgments here. Um, what's the one thing you wish you knew when you first got sober? That I was real young. <laughs> <laughs> How old were you when you got sober? 28. Ooh. Yeah. I I thought I had, like I had lost my room my whole life. 
uh, and and I worried for years about it. it. Took me decades to realize it that I yeah, wasn't. Yeah, and now now that we're a little further down the line, we're yeah, like, damn, yeah. we were young. <laughs> we were young. <laughs> Didn't appreciate it when I had it. Right. Uh, that's funny. Um, what do you do for fun these days? What do I do for fun? Well, these bottles behind me are not uh, gin and vodka. I was going to ask you about that. I'm like, what is going on with the bottles? <laughs> They're not gin and vodka. They're waters from all over the world. I collect water from all over the world, and oh. it's a little bit obsessive. But, um, that's that's fun for you? Okay. It's, uh, do you yeah, have to travel fun. to these places to get the water? Well, that's part of the deal, and I'm trying okay. to get a blog together that, you know, I go there. travel and blog. I, yeah, that I you know, show the waters off while I'm there. Kind of Did thing. you see that Netflix episode, uh, series with uh, Zac Efron and Darren? I did. That guy is one of my mentors. Darren is? No, the guy. The guy yeah, Darren Rouse. Or no, no. What's his name? Uh, Not Zac Efron. No, the, the guy. The, the water <laughs> yeah, sommelier. Darren. Yeah. The water oh. sommelier. Oh, no, really? No, Martin Reese. Martin Reese. The guy who is doing the... the uh, the water. Uh, he did education. a water sommelier yeah, edu- education. They were sitting at a pool. Actually, the, you're, the guy you're talking about was not with him at that time. A woman was with him. Uh, she was another movie star, but the guy Martin Reese, he's a sommelier here in Los Angeles. Yeah. A, wa- a water sommelier. And he was doing the demonstration for right. Zach. Yeah. So, so, yeah, it was pretty cool. No, D- Darren is, um, I can't remember his last name, but he is a an author that talks about using food. You know how to heal your body through food. I can't remember his last name. Yeah, I'll, no, I'll he's find an it. explorer, and the two of them go around the world, kind of like uh, An- Anthony Bourdain did. <laughs> right, right. The two absolutely. Of them um, yeah, I'll have to find links to those. But yeah, that was a really interesting. I did not know that that there were such differences in the kinds of water that are available, like the filtered water, the pure water. I didn't really even think about how important it is to get um, vitamins and minerals, or maybe it's just minerals from your water. Well, it's so like, look, I'm getting really into this thing about the the bioavailability of minerals in water, exactly what they talk about. Filtered water, Asante, uh, you know, or uh, Desante and Aquafina, these crappy waters are just basically coming from a factory. If you don't get a water that's in a bottle, uh, in a glass bottle that's filtered or that's um, coming directly from the spring, you're ripping out the magnesium and the calcium and all these things. And there's a new book out called The Mineral Fix. And in The Mineral Fix, He's got two chapters on the bioavailability of the water and why the water is so much better than supplements or even food, wow. like 20 times better for the bioavailability of the The most important thing when you're recovering from any substance use disorder, especially sugar, is magnesium and calcium. And magnesium and calcium don't play together well when you're doing supplementation. And so... It's better to uh, ingest it uh, like a, basically a slow drip all day, drinking uh, the, the waters right behind me that, you know, you can uh, get actual bi- uh, minerals, calcium, silica, which is good for your skin, all these kinds of good things uh, comes from the, from the good mineral waters. Good. And people, the main crap, <laughs> I shouldn't say it this way, the main bitch people have is that, well, you know, it, it's like, why if you can just get it out of a tap or whatever, well, here's the thing. In Europe, they have 100% recyclability of glass, okay? And we're close to that in the United States. We're high with, you know, the, the fees you required on the bottles and deposits and stuff. The bottles, the glass bottles get recycled at a level that's so much higher than plastic. Not quite 100% in the United States, but it's getting there. So there's no reason why you can't drink uh, mineral water, good quality mineral water out of glass, out of glass. Good to And it's know. healthy for you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's, you know, one of the things that uh, people are going to learn is what to eat instead. Maybe, you know, including mineral water in, in the diet is also very important. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, the mineral fix, I'll make a note of that as well. Um, okay, well, that's kind of it for the lightning round. I'm so always so curious as to people's recovery journey. Do you want to share a little bit about your family of origin and like maybe how old you were when you started using and how you yeah. got off of it? Yeah, no, I'd be happy to. Um, you know, I, I grew up in a in an alcoholic family. Basically, my father was a you know a, a binge drinker. Uh, 
he didn't drink every day. When he drank, he was gone for a day or two, you know, that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, I think he had PTSD from the Korean War and he grew up kind of rough with the, uh, you know, his mom. They were, they're, they're, his parents were way ahead of themselves in the 1950s, 40s. They got divorced. So he was left um to live with his father at nine years old or whatever. Scandalous. Where was mom? He didn't go with mom? Well, no. And mom's family owned a bar. Uh, So it was a, you know, it was quite a, quite a, quite a colorful history. But, you know, my father was, uh, he was a drinker. I mean, he just, he never really got over it. And uh, he controlled it at the end of his life. But, you know, he, he was always, uh, when he drank, he got drunk kind of thing. Mm, And I grew up with that. Yeah, watching that can be very difficult. And yeah. I found that people either go to extremes, either they follow in the footsteps or they go polar opposite and right. maintain total abstinence. But how old were you when you first started drinking? Um, probably 13, 14, you know, mm-hmm. 14, 14 regular. Like we were at 16, we were in bars twice a week. You, know. you could be in a bar at 16? Well, we would go to these out in the country bars. They didn't care. <laughs> Where did you grow up? <laughs> Central New York, near Syracuse. Oh, okay. Country bars. Wow, I am so glad I didn't have access to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they didn't even ask. They didn't care. Wow. Did you have a sense of why you were drinking? Like, No, this- not at all. One of the things I tell about the story about why sugar is such a problem is that uh, there's a great video on on uh, YouTube. Eric Clapton talking to Ed Bradley at 60 Minutes, right. and they're sitting in a seven million dollar Antigua, uh, tr- uh, you know, Antigua treatment center, and he said, uh, Ed Bradley says, so Eric, this addiction thing it started with heroin. Uh, Eric Clapton says, no, it started with sugar. Wow. Five years old, I was eating bread and butter and sugar sandwiches to change my state. <laughs> And I, I didn't realize I was changing my state with the sugar. My mother was the sugar junkie, okay? Yeah. So I had that, you know, double whammy, if you will. Sure. But when I got to be 13 or 14 and ran into beer, I knew that changed my state. I knew that I was more courageous talking to girls. I was kind of shy, and I could go talk with the, you know, go to the dance, drink behind the high school and go to the dance. And uh, that I knew. I understood that. But when I quit drinking and got in recovery, as did most of my fellows, as do most people in recovery, I went right back to sugar, Mm -hmm. not knowing that it was making me feel just a little bit better every time I ingested. And that's the key to getting off sugar and alcohol, too, I think. But, you know, it's fair. The reason I started, I didn't know. The answer to your question is, no, I didn't know why. I thought it was a party. Right. And I thought that I was, uh, you know. I did know about that one benefit. We called it liquid courage. I'm sure you've heard that term. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, where I could uh, talk to, uh, be- but I felt better about myself. Uh, that was really, that I knew. Um, and again, how conscious it was, I just thought I was hanging with the boys, right? Right, right. For many, many years. And that's, and I never thought anything more about it. What all these, any answer I would give you would be hindsight at this point. You know? Sure. Yeah. Back then, I didn't know. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's pretty common, right? I, I didn't yeah. I didn't learn until I got sober that drinking was just a symptom of a deeper problem. You know, anything that we use to distract from ourselves, right. from our feelings, really, anything that we use, whether it's addiction, and, and in my mind, obsession works the same way. It's a distraction from what you're not okay with, you right. know, some kind of feeling. And I, you know, I don't know about you, I didn't exactly grow up with any kind of coping skills. Um, so that yeah. became, <laughs> that, exactly. yeah, that became my rage and anger. Mm, well, for boys, that's acceptable. Anger is yeah, acceptable yeah. for boys, sadness right. and feeling your feelings. It's my understanding that boys are yeah, not allowed. Correct. To... <laughs> that is correct. I, that is not cool. I tell a story that, you know, when I got sober and then I finally had my, what I call my dark night of soul, I figured it out. I had not cried in uh, in twenty plus twenty one years or something like that. Wow. <laughs> and um, I there's... wanted to. I tried in therapy. I was trying. I couldn't make it happen. I was like, "How do you do this? How does it work?" Yeah, because I had stuffed it down so hard. I'd, I'd figured out how to stop it so hard. Yeah, the f- with substances uh, without them. You, what were you trying to stop? The feelings. I well, I realized, like I said, in hindsight, I realized that. Yeah. I, 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 but I didn't know that then. I, I didn't know it when I was doing it. Uh, it was an unconscious as both the sugar and the alcohol 
have this this unconscious ability to because it's pretty much available especially sugar even to children um you know uh we don't realize that it you know that that it does stamp down your feelings i always talk about the proverbial <clears throat> person who's in food addiction recovery person lost 100 200 pounds uh, you know, that person does not talk about the weight or the, well, they don't know. They don't talk about the weight, the food or the exercise. What they talk about is what you and I are talking about, the emotional rejiggering, how they had to mm-hmm. literally reframe their whole life and handle their emotions in a different way through yoga or exercise or, you know, a hug or a meeting or a phone call or something. Mm-hmm. And that's, what most people don't get both in substance use disorder recovery and definitely in sugar recovery. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to go back to something you said, you mentioned the dark night of the soul. Is that, is that what you would consider to be like your bottom or maybe like a moment of clarity? My dark night of the soul happened at five years sober when I got divorced. Um, and it also happened um, uh, after I quit flower uh, and it was what I believe the um, all of the pain, all the hurt, all the anger that I had stuffed uh, was coming out with no filters. I also threw a television against the fireplace when I moved out. And so I didn't have a television. So here I was naked, basically. Now, I used the relationship. I'd use flour and sugar and caffeine and television and all the things that people in recovery use. Um, And when all those were taken away, I, you know, went into a 12 or 18 month period. Now, luckily I had built up men's groups, a therapy group, a therapist. And so I knew kind of what was happening, but that didn't stop it from happening. And a lot of people turn back at that point. What happens is the ubiquitous nature of sugar, uh, even if you're in recovery, you know, what we have, when I first went public with my substance use disorder, my parents were alive. I didn't, I was an anonymous guy for um, all of my recovery. And about five or six years ago, when they passed away, I went public and I was doing this sugar work. And I had this huge flood of people from recovery, people sober, 5, 10, 15. One of my coaches is 20 years sober but they could not put down the sugar. They had gained incredible amounts of weight. They had got diabetes diagnosis. They're quote unquote sober, but they couldn't put down the sugar. And so when they, as I did, quit the sugar and started to get into this recovery, those folks had their dark night of the soul. They started to have to reckon with the feelings that the sugar had covered up for them. So, I mean, it's a, like I said, I like the arc of a podcast, especially recovery podcasts, because um, the people in recovery, and I love them dearly, owe my life to them. But if they're not examining their flour, sugar, caffeine, and nicotine addictions, um, they're still, there's a lot covered up. And I have hundreds of people to prove it that would love to talk with them that have been in quote unquote substance use disorder recovery, but now are going to the next level and, and handling and man- finally managing those emotions. So that's yeah. what my dark night of the soul was. I mean, so I've been thinking a lot about this lately and I think my new tagline is going to be get sober, stay sober, go deeper. Right. Mm, and I'm all I about like that. Yeah. It's not good. <laughs> I like that. I, I won't I, steal that one. I sometimes. I mean, go ahead. Go ahead. Listen, my ultimate goal is to lead people out of suffering. So if, if that's useful to you, uh, I, right. I, I couldn't care less. Um, I, I, I care so much. I just want people to, to alleviate their suffering. And I agree with you. It's like, I remember being first sober and hearing, be careful not to switch addictions. Mm. Right. But they're really, you know, th- the message was be aware of that, but stay focused on your program, right? For me, it was a, did you, you said you stayed anonymous for a long time until about five years ago. Um, yeah. I just want to kind of close the loop on the recovery piece. So you recognize that the drugs and alcohol were a problem. And then did you go to a 12-step t- a group? 
Oh, yeah. My whole, you know, for the most of my recovery, I mean, near the last 10 or 15 years, I didn't go very much. I had other things come up <laughs> like we all I mean, do. Listen, tw- Money, you- debt, uh, this, yeah. that, the other, like, you know, <laughs> relationships, codependent, you know. I, the whole like, thing. I wasn't using drugs, but I had more. As you, I was going deeper, as you say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I heard somebody say that... Um, Something to the effect that it doesn't matter what the problem is, the solution is the same. The solution is spiritual, it's simple, and it has nothing to do with the problem, right? Like Very little to do. With very little to do with the actual problem. It's all about People you. always want a, a food plan and an exercise plan from me. I'm like, <laughs> that's got nothing to do with it. Oh, I can't like, wait to find not, out. Yeah, so to we're going to talk. I want to switch gears to start to answer those three, three questions that we sort of talked about in the very beginning, you know, but let's talk a little bit about, thank you for sharing, you know, how you got sober and all that. I think it's important for people to sort of get the context of where you're coming from. You have years of experience in, in that uh, addiction recovery space. Um, I do want to answer a quick question with the, you know, regards to the anonymity is I, I started to study Bill White and William White and the new recovery advocacy movement, which you know, K Street, Washington, D.C., huge nonprofits believe that the reduction of stigma comes from an average person set, telling their story. A congressman and a movie star is great, but it's, you know, the average people telling their story. And I said, I'm in. That makes sense. Yeah. So that's partly to how it happened. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm not anonymous either. I, the funny thing is, is I wasn't anonymous about my using. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like right. when I drank, everybody knew. Right. Yeah, yeah. That was not, I was not subtle. So um, yeah. that's why I'm not anonymous about my recovery either. Plus, I, you know, there is a lot of stigma still um, in sure. regards to drugs and alcohol. So I think it's important that. Well, I never had a job in my life, so I didn't have that to worry about. I've always been an entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have to worry about keeping up. <laughs> well, and that's, and that's why the anonymity was so important in the beginning, because I thought it w- actually, that's not even true. The very beginning, if you, um, in the book of Alcoholics Anonymous, there were so many inquiries, so many people asking for help and so few people, um, equipped to respond that those people had to be anonymous because they were just overwhelmed by the requests for help. Yeah. And then it became more like, um, a job prospect thing. Like if you admitted that you were in recovery, that you were an alcoholic, that you couldn't get a job. So I, I think some of that stigma, that stigma still exists. For sure. Yeah. You know, I yeah. Mean, oh, yeah. That, it's I it's think the only, still, it's yeah. the only drug that you have to explain why you're not doing it. Even, people even <laughs> get the sugar thing, right? Like everybody yeah, yeah. wants to lose weight. So Right. Um, I, I couldn't agree with you more, but, um, okay. So let's talk a little bit about how sugar affects the brain. I've heard you talk before in other podcasts about the dopamine reward system. And yeah, I, I've, I've talked to other, um, neuroscientists who talk about dopamine being like the save button. You take an action and then you have a feeling and then dopamine mm-hmm. is released and it's like, Oh, Hey, remember, remember this. Remember that pleasure. <laughs> yeah, remember this. So how it, talk to me a little bit how you think of it in terms of sugar and neurochemistry. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's really exciting about my work in the last five years is the explosion of the science around all this. Yeah. Um, it's really just, I mean, I, I always keep this book handy. I don't know where it went. Here it is. Um, you know, Hooked. Guy wrote a, it's like he, he won a Pulitzer Prize, not for this book, but it's a Michael Moss. He also wrote Sugar, Fat, and Salt. Um, the tagline is Food, Free Will, and How the Food Giants Exploit Our Addictions, right? Okay. And, uh, you know, we have these summits every year, Quit Sugar Summit. Mm-hmm. And during the summit, we have everybody. I mean, all of the most brilliant, neuro, like he's a neuroscientist and um, people that have been studying fructose and you know, the food system, the food companies have weaponized uh, science against us to keep us addicted, keep us coming back. They're, you know, getting children addicted earlier and earlier. And the simple answer is that the dopamine receptors are downregulated. You have less of them. They're thinned out when you use uh, massive amounts of sugar. And, you know, the dose makes the poison. Like we take a little heroin, we take a little alcohol, we take a little cocaine. But we are a little cocaine. (laughs) 
<laughs> we are, yeah, no, well, not me, but uh, a lot of people do. And, and, but no, seriously. I'm, no, I'm sorry, I've lot. never heard of anybody taking a little bit of heroin or a little bit of cocaine. <laughs> well, what I'm saying is if you, even if you take a lot of it, it's yeah. still tiny compared to uh, the average of 21 teaspoons of sugar a day. Oh, yeah. and, and, and if you don't have a, um, um, you know, if you got a bad habit, you know, 30, 40, 50 teaspoons of sugar a day. I mean, wow. a Coke is 12. So think about it. anybody's got a Coke, the Coca-Cola habit, you know, yeah. they're, they're pounding, you know, 50 right before they get start before they eat anything. And so Crazy. it's the dose makes the poison. And probably since the womb, no one in very few people in this society have gone 24 hours without sugar. And 400 years ago, 500 years ago, we ate very little fructose, which for your listeners, half of the sugar molecule is glucose and half of it's fructose. And it's the fructose that's the offending molecule. I've asked many of these neuroscientists, is fructose a psychoactive drug? And this is the core of my, my work and the core of the future. It's about, you wanna study sugar, study fructose, okay? I've got two guys coming on the summit this year that did a paper that they've, they've already started to get some patents on from the discoveries of blocking fructose. And fructose, uh, four or 500 years ago, seven million years of evolution, we had, there's no, we had about, you know, one little bit of fructose when things were ripe once a year. And the effect that the fructose has on the frontal lobe, on the brain, on the nucleus accumbens is so huge. It's identical to heroin. It's identical to alcohol. It's identical to drugs. And it's only the dose that makes the poison. The volume of the amount of stuff and the consistency, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, there's no time to even relax or, or get off the stuff. And we are just destroying literally our decision-making processes. I always say this, look, somebody comes into me a hundred pounds overweight. They are not, they do not have the mental capacity. People think this is too strong, but I don't think it anymore. People th that it, they do not have the mental capacity to understand what this habit is doing to them. And they don't understand when, when somebody gets 90 days, they slap their head and they say, I can't believe the things I used to do. My brain fog is cleared up. I'm thinking clear. I'm sleeping better. And this is not someone who's ever done alcohol or alcohol or drugs or whatever. This is just sugar, flour, and caffeine. And when you see it, like pat, genius is only pattern recognition, right? It's like when, you, when you've seen a thousand people go through this process and you see the, you know, X amount come out the other end, not quite a thousand. I would be lying to say a thousand came out the other end, but thousands of people one-on-one -on -one, have gone through this process. And when they get to the other side, their life is transformed weight-wise, skin-wise, brain-wise, um, motivation-wise. Um, I've got bunches of people that got off SSRIs, bunches of people that put type 2 diabetes in, into remission. And it's all to do, look, we know what the glucose molecules do into the body. Metabolic disease, probably Alzheimer's, which they're calling diabetes three, is you know Alzheimer's now. Um, uh, you know, uh, diabetes in general. We know what that's doing, but what is less known, and what now is the reason why people are starting to understand they can't stay stopped, is the fructose's effect on the nucleus accumbens and the dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, GABA, adrenal glands even your endorphins, the running, you know, the ones that make you feel better. All of this stuff is affected by sugar and, you know, destroyed basically by sugar, um, manipulated by sugar. And when you take that manipulation away, when you go abstinent, you go into withdrawals. That should be the biggest clue. Anybody, an adult who quits with any habit at all, quits flour, sugar, and caffeine at the same time, they are going to be incapacitated in days two, three, and four. They're not going to be able to go to work. They're not going to be able to uh, parent. They're going to have to have some time off. They're going to be starving. They're going to be depressed. You know, they're going to have headaches probably. This is 90% of people when they quit all these quote unquote legal drugs. And it's a, uh, okay, I'll get off my soapbox, but <laughs> you get what I'm saying. Fascinating. Um, you know, it's so funny because in the recovery, I'm in a lot of recovery groups and there's always this debate, you know, when people start bringing up things like uh, harm reduction, 
mm-hmm. you know, or what's what's sobriety and what isn't when we're talking about, you know, should weed be legal or does we are do you does your sobriety count if you're smoking weed? But and then the argument is always people are addicted to nicotine, caffeine, sugar. What am I missing one? Uh, oh, flour. Yeah. Um, right. So and and they they have that argument holds water right like it really is a mind altering these are mind altering substances that you know and i don't know it's it's tough to cut everything all at once and and i i I go at your own pace but you know me sitting at 27 years of sobriety i have never addressed my sugar issues Mm. i'm a little chubby right now that's fine but i also have family members who i am recognizing have um you know, a sugar addiction as well. So this is so fascinating to me that um, I'm, I'm so glad to be talking. Well, they still call it the good girl's drug. I told you this story, you know, my mother, my father drank, my, my mother did sugar. And, you know, if I had to gauge which one was worse for their mind and their body and their brain, uh, my mom got the Alzheimer's earlier, aged worse, uh, had every malady known to man. Uh, and it was all the sugar. She just couldn't quit. Her grandma, my grandmother, her mother died when she was just eight years old. And they made a pact, my grandfather and her aunt, uh, who they had to move into. They owned the country store across the way. And my mom would go in there and uh, um, they said, just give her whatever candy she wants. That was a great gesture, right? And I swear to the day she died, she believed sugar was love. And they didn't know back then. Nobody knew. Nobody knew till like really the last five, 10, 15 years, you know, Mm -hmm. well, actually people did know, but they got, (laughs) they got suppressed by governments and big sugar, you know, and now the, the movement, if you will, is just too strong. It's just too strong. Yeah. People really have to take And you're not alone. 50% of the people that, uh, addiction podcasters who uh, get, (laughs) get with me had a a sugar thing going on. And it's like, yeah, you know, it's like, and it's, it's so subtle. It's, it's so, so subtle. like and so socially acceptable. I mean, you yeah. give this product to a one year old with no moral, illegal, or ethical worries yeah. or obligations. Yeah. And it's a tectonic shift in, in, in understanding now that the science is here, like seatbelts in cars or drinking and driving. It's right. now that the science says when you drink and drive, you're not capable. And when you crash and you don't have a seatbelt on, you're going to die more. Right. That's when society changes. And this science is going to change this society. Absolutely. I, I love this um, work that you're doing. Okay, so the other question that always comes up is, um, you know, what to eat instead. And I, I know we only have like nine minutes and I have two questions for you. I want to know what to eat instead and then yeah. how, to, how to quit sugar. So I'm going to reframe this a little and, and, and twist it a little on you because, yes, you eat whole food. Yes, you drink water. Yes, you sleep. And yes, you exercise, mostly just walking. Okay. But at the end of the day, this recovery is the same as the recovery in in Mm -hmm. any other substance use disorder. It's not about, you know, putting the plug in the jug. Yeah, you got to do that. And yeah, you got to eat whole food. But this is about understanding what sugar did for your mental, uh, uh, you know, what what emotionally and mentally you had depended on sugar to uh, manage your emotional uh, life. And when you realize, when you journal it out and realize it, you you know, most of my clients know more about uh, nutrition and food than I do. Mm. My job, and you mentioned harm reduction and um, uh, what's the other one? Peer recovery. Two things I've adopted from the recovery movement, which is, Harm reduction. Every day you go without sugar is a good day. And if it happened to be every day you went with Suboxone and not met uh, uh, heroin, that was a good day, right? I I came up as an abstinence-based guy. In my early days in Narcotics Anonymous, if you used Suboxone, you were not clean. Right. That's crap in my world. And that took me 20 years almost to understand that. Mm -hmm. And I use the same concept and the same awakening in the sugar world. If you just made it six days, no sugar, that's six days. That's a start, you know. You know, okay, you had a bad weekend or a birthday or whatever, start again Monday morning. Eventually, that harm reduction process gets you, and that peer recovery group helps you get to the other side and don't give up. And so, 
it's really honest to God. And I hate to say this, but when people are 90 days down the line, what they ate and, and what foods they ate are like really low on the list of what they talk about is the benefits, their diet. Right. Is, it's about brain fog. It's about, um, it's about feeling better. It's about their skin being better. It's all these better things. And it's really not their diet or their recipes, you know? I know that's harsh, but it's it's true. No, it's not harsh at all. I mean, I'm all about, you know, let's talk about the truth, right? Yeah. This is, that's the truth. Yeah. Um, man, it, this is, it, when you talk about brain fog, I'm 52, and I, don't, I was like, oh, it's because I'm older. You know, my everything's changing, right? Um, it never, just let's, let's just not pay attention to the cookies that I'm baking. And <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So if, like, getting off sugar is going to help my brain frog, I – not frog fog um, yeah all I, those yeah <laughs> I'm super it's the number one that. benefit people mention past really? 90 and 120 days yeah I'm so they remember better they sugar. sleep better they're processing better they oh literally things they, they can do their job better a lot of things uh mentally and their motivation returns i truly believe and you can write that oh you're writing everything down but you I can am. write this one down okay sugar is an a motivational drug a motivational got a lot of its history and been kind of pushed to the side about the cannabinoid. I always say it wrong. Cannab cannabis rece <laughs> cannabis receptors in the uh, in the body, but from marijuana, everybody says if you're a stoner, you're, you're you know you have a motivational syndrome. Yeah. I'm telling you, you can't get up the couch off the couch to go to the exercise because you're drink you're drinking or eating an anti an a motivational syndrome drug. Oh. My period God. end of story that's a real fact that's and most people most people will uh cop to the ideas like my energy came back my motivation came back you know i kind of was writing it off to brain fog and stuff but then i realized that when i get an accidental ingestation which is okay about five times in the last 10 years where somebody swore a salad dressing didn't have any sugar in it. They made it themselves, but they didn't look at this greedy and that. Greedy. So I just kind of enjoy the buzz, but the next morning I can't get out of bed. Isn't that I mean, something? it's crazy. Yeah. You know? So, Oh my gosh. I'm okay. So we're going to talk about that, the, how to quit this stuff. Um, and I want to talk about your 30 day challenge. So it's currently the beginning of June and I think I'm going to do this challenge with myself and with my women's group and with my podcast, you know, newsletter people and all the ways that people are connected with me. I want to do this for July. So yeah. um, we're going to send people to sugaraddiction.com forward slash Arlena. Arlena is spelled A-R-L-I-N-A. -A. I'll leave links to everything in the show notes so that people can do this challenge with me. I desperately need to do this challenge. Cool. Um, so we can do it as a group. And I was going to offer that uh, people that sign up through for, for your challenge. It's $97. Holy moly, that is the cheapest thing I have ever seen ever because we are going to save so much money. Never mind. Oh, yeah. Never mind heartache month. and brain fog and motivation yeah. um, in, in just coffee and sugar alone. <laughs> so it's sure. a money saving yeah. activity, actually. But I will also include, you know, I have two programs that I offer, which is Sobriety Reset and the Reinvent class, which is a, I advocate for sobriety through self esteem. Like as well it. as 12 step and the whole thing. Yeah. But uh, I will, you know, you buy through my link to do, do the sugar challenge with me. I'll give you half off of one of my classes. Um, so that is my offer to you. But okay, so the challenge is 30 days. It is. It's 30 days. Um, I come into your inbox every single day with a video with PowerPoints and everything. So it's a lot of information, but it's also. Like I said, over thousands of detoxes, we've kind of figured out what happens on day one, day two, all the way through to day 30. And a lot of information, people, I'll give you an example. We've never had a refund. It's the craziest thing. I've been in, you know, my career before I got into all this was yeah. internet stuff. And, you know, obviously refunds were part of life. Sure. But we've never had a refund in this because wild? people are really, they're enjoying it. They get into the group. So the first seven days, what happens is they, um, um, 
we don't, you don't even have to quit sugar. The first seven days I'm prepping you, prepping your house, prepping your family, prepping you uh, psychically, mentally, uh, emotionally, physically, cleaning out the house, all that kind of good stuff. And then on the eighth day, we start with no sugar. And more importantly, we have Zoom meetings seven days a week that you're able to plug into. We have a forum with over 11,000 people in it on, on Facebook and another forum off Facebook, if you're not a Facebook person, um, that's not quite as traffic, but it's still pretty big. And uh, what else we got? We got, uh, oh, during that, we do, I told you, I mentioned a couple of times, we do this Quit Sugar Summit. Mm-hmm. So we've got 75 videos from all the best educators and researchers in the world uh, that come with the challenge. And we've got a core video that used to be $2,500, my personal coaching stuff when I used to do that. Um, those are four videos that cover the food, as you, you know, we've mentioned, mm-hmm. the emotions, the social, which is huge, people, huge. the food pushers. And the, most people that come to us are usually the only person in their family willing and wanting to do this. They've got a spouse, they got kids, they got whatever. They're not, you know, they're kind of alone, even in their nuclear family to do this. Right. So that um, that's a whole hour. Those are all hour and a half courses. So really in tall total, there's over a hundred plus videos to uh, kind of peruse, but the more important ones are the ones that co- I come in every day and the, you know, the week or the daily zoom meetings that they can just plug right into. I'm super excited about that. Yeah. Listen, I know you got to go, but uh, I just want to thank you so much for the work that you're doing. I'm super excited to invite my audience to your world and do this challenge. As of this recording, it's June, but we're going to do the challenge in July. Yeah. So I am really excited. Michael, thank you so much for, for joining you. me today. And I can't well, wait. Well, I enjoyed it. I love talking to addiction <laughs> podcasters. This is my favorite thing. I swear, I really yeah. believe, and I'm going to say this one last time, but I believe that addiction podcast, addiction, recovering people in addiction, once they get the sugar thing, can change this world in a big way, above and beyond what they're already doing for sugar, for uh, you know regular drugs. I don't want to say regular drugs, but you know alcohol. I know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So thank uh, you so much. Thank you, and have a great day. We'll talk soon. Thanks for having me. One last thing before you go, if you enjoyed the podcast today, please don't forget to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher and leave a review. And if you'd like to make a donation to the podcast and help me keep the lights on, you can do so by visiting odatchat.com. There's a donation button or membership button on the right hand side. Have a great day. Thank you so much for joining us.